Welcome to Married to History, where we try to be informative, entertaining, and family-friendly. Aloha! I'm Christopher. I have a fancy piece of paper on my wall that says that I know more about history than most people do. I'm Shirley. I'm a homeschool mom that relies on good curriculum, Christopher, and horrible histories to teach our kids history. Yeah, not going to touch that. Before we get into our episode, let's take a minute to talk about something from a past episode. It's important to keep in mind that Shirley doesn't warn me about our topic beforehand. See, I didn't bring up anything about your saying that already and that history is not being horrible. I didn't say any of that. Except you are. No, I didn't. Now. Yep, it's fun for me to see what he knows right off the top of his head, and that means sometimes we miss things. If you would like to hear a more comprehensive and well-prepared episode on any topic, just let us know. So, honey, what have we learned since last time? Uh, if I remember correctly, I was curious after our uh, conversation about the um, Achilles, about the, the Trojan War. What? No, this wasn't about Achilles. This was about Aeneas. The episode was Achilles. Oh, sorry. Okay. I had mentioned to you the... Um, the Roman claim that uh, Aeneas, the guy who supposedly escaped from right. Troy with a handful of Trojans and then came and settled to uh, establish Rome. Yeah. Uh, I remember that one of the things that always kind of bothered me about the story was the idea that, okay, it's, it seemed like a ludicrous idea that Aeneas is the one that came and uh, settled and helped found Rome because, amongst other things, well, the timing was off. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, the first time that I heard the story, the idea was presented to me that, okay, Rome was founded first and then Aeneas and his followers settled in it mm -hmm. and I don't know I, I get since that was the first time I heard it I guess that idea just got cemented in my head somehow but mm -hmm. when we were talking about it for that episode I was going to say okay well Trojan War that we believe is 1200 BC uh, Rome is founded about 750 BC sure so that means that Aeneas and his people should have been first so I looked up something else and found that, all right, so either whoever taught me the, the, or whoever planted that idea in my head that Aeneas was uh, after Romulus and Remus founded the city uh -huh. uh, was wrong or I misunderstood Way it at the off. time or whatever the case. So, yeah, the thing that I looked at this time said that, no, no, okay, apparently Rome's claim is that Romulus and Remus were descendants of Aeneas. So Aeneas and his right. survivors settle somewhere in uh, northern it or well northern or central Italy, uh -huh. and then eventually their descendants are Romulan and R Romulus and Remus, who will found Rome. I thought Romulus and Remus were descended from wolves. Romulus and Remus were raised by <laughs> wolves, but they had a human mother. Okay. Oh, I got to take that back. Did maybe they? their maybe their mother was a goddess or a demigoddess. I don't remember I don't, off the top of my head. But they were raised by wolves, <laughs> not birthed by wolves. Anything's possible, honey. It's ancient Rome and Greece. <laughs> I have never encountered a legend that I can recall that suggests that they were n born of these wolves. No, they were abandoned as infants by their mother, whether she be god or otherwise, yeah. and raised by wolves. Okay. But Aeneas was their great-great-granddaddy. Yeah, something like that. Cool. Given that, well, let's see here, what, a 500-year difference given generations back at that time? I don't know. Probably five, five, five great-granddaddy? There's probably 25 greats, I'd say, in there. Wait. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not doing that. 500 years I'm thinking generation back then. I'm thinking people lived to be 100. <laughs> not back then. Uh, gener a baby generation in those days, probably going to be about every 20 years or so yeah, another generation. Yeah. So, I'd say, yeah, that's probably 25 generations in between Aeneas and... Uh, Romulus and Remus. That's a lot. I'm not sure you can get credit for founding the city if, if it doesn't happen until like 25 generations after you and Aeneas. <laughs> I'm just saying. Mm. So we're saying uh, Abraham is not the father of many nations? Because that's probably more than 25 generations since then. I don't know. We're not going there. <laughs> All right. Oh, come on, honey. You just offended <laughs> Jews and Christians and Muslims alike. You just offended two thirds of the planet's population. Yeah, that's not very hard to do. All right, um, we got another listener email from Andy again. Oh, him again. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say mean things like we that. Know about our loyal listeners, don't we know him in real life. Yes, and we know him in real life, and we do like him. Yes, I like him. <laughs> don't chase him away. And I don't talk enough. That's true. Well, that's because we don't hang out. All right, anyways, he, he just sent a really nice email on um, feedback after listening to our Banana Republics episode. Mm -hmm. And he said, I love it that Christopher is not afraid to mention America's flaws. We try to be Everybody very has flaws. balanced and I, fair here. There's yeah, no point in I, like... I, I, Pretending I, we're perfect. I, I despise that attitude, and this is entirely a political attitude of, oh, we have to appear to be flawless. We can't let people know about our 
failures, our misgivings, or whatnot. What does every parent tell their child when their child messes up on something or doesn't do something perfectly? Do we tell them, all right, you forget about that. You pretend like it never happened. You <laughs> put that Pinewood Derby cart together perfectly. You aced well... that spelling bee where you got everything wrong. No, we tell them, hey, yeah, that stinks. I get it. But you know what? Let's try to do better next time. Well, Learn from the experience. I mean, some parents. Good parents. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you for that email. And he also included some comments he had about the idea of presentism in history, which we've uh, discussed before. Yeah. So we love listener emails. Anytime you want to send something in, whether it's a question for us to read on air or just some discussion. We love having history discussions and learning more. So thank you for that. All right, well, honey, I have a history question for you today. I love history questions. Give it to me. All right, so we mentioned back in our Suffragette episode about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Yes. And I'm so confused. Oh, no. I'm going to hate this how, question. How did they make triangle-shaped shirts? I can't picture this at all. What, you never seen Mork and Mindy? <laughs> that was before my time. You <laughs> hurt me, Willis. <laughs> Willis, where does that come from? All right, so uh, if I'm remembering correctly, Mork and Mindy had a very triangle-like design on their uh, their space uniform. Oh, the upside-down triangle. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I, so I, that, I've seen that. So yeah, you can make a shirt look like that. <laughs> It's just got, it's big at the shoulders. It slims down to, uh, when you get to the closer thinking... to the navel. I wouldn't be surprised out there. If, I'm pretty sure that I have yeah. seen many a clothing design based on that <laughs> idea of okay, yeah, the shoulders are the shoulders are closed, but the belly yeah. is nice and exposed. Yeah, yeah, it's a triangle shape. Well, I was thinking triangle the other way, like uh, maternity dresses from the I 60s. I was say, there's your other one. <laughs> dresses. They're big no, and poofy like... at the bottom, and then when you get it closer to the neck, they slim up. The triangle. Right, but, but calling it a triangle shirt waist factory implies to me that there is a waist structure of some kind. So how can you have a shirt that's triangle shaped and also has a waist? All right. So I do not remember for sure what shirt waists were. I think it had something that. to do with the, like the, with the, like the the edges or a little bit of extra fabric around the waist or the edges of when mm -hmm. material was sewn together. I I don't remember for sure, but shirt waists were a thing, okay. and this factory was just the Triangle Factory, and it rented. I want to say it rented the top three floors of. Oh, it's a button down blouse. That's just what it was called. Oh, okay. I, well, I thought it was a specific part of the material instead of the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, it was just um, modeled on menswear shirts for women. Good, simple design, good for working women. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, if I remember correctly, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, I believe they rented the top three or at least upper three floors of a skyscraper. Or, well, okay, this wouldn't have been a skyscraper. A, a very tar, a tall building uh, in New York. Oh, pretty sure it was in New York. I'm not doubting that. All right, anyway. So they it was a it was a city factory. They occupied several floors of it, uh -huh. and as was a common practice back in the day to make sure that your employees were working their hardest and not mm -hmm. sneaking out or uh, taking breaks or whatnot, the workers were often locked in so that they couldn't, like I said, just sneak out or whatnot. Great plan. And this was uh, long before the days of uh, that we have today of uh, like a, what what are those organizations that make sure that workers are working OSHA. in safe conditions? Yeah. So think about this. this. Let me paint the picture for you. Pause. All these women. Oh. What what years are we talking about here? Uh, this was the early 1910s or early to mid 1910s. Is this considered industrial revolution? Because this was before this tail end of the okay. industrial uh, revolution because now we're getting into the turn of the century or well, we're even past the turn of the century. Okay. So at this point in time, the industrial revolution has had its uh, has had its primary impact. Yeah. And now things are just slowly and slowly creeping up. Oh, I shouldn't say slowly. Things are creeping up better in their efficiency and their technology and okay. whatnot until we're eventually going to get to the golden age of the 20s. But okay. we're not there yet yeah. when the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory happens. Got it. I don't remember the date off the top of my head. I want to say the year at least was 1912, but, but I might be remembering wrong on that. Okay. And this was one of the things that inspired to pointing out the necessity for groups like OSHA for mm -hmm. unions and having safe working conditions right. for women's rights since um, if I remember correctly all of the victims of this were women. Uh, I want to paint the picture of what the environment was like there. Again because there were no safety regulations or whatnot and this was a time of the, the purest form of capitalism and that the idea uh, and the idea of the greed of capitalism of yeah. okay no we just want 
as many things as possible so that we can sell as many of them as possible yeah. for as cheap as possible to make the most product possible. Right. So right. sweatshops. So, crank them out as yeah, fast as you can, so, as cheap as you can. You got, you got an awful lot of women. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but an awful lot of women crammed into these facilities uh-huh. with rows and rows of sewing machines. Mm-hmm. And uh, anybody who's ever worked with fabric or sewing machines mm-hmm. means that there's going to be scrap from time to time, which means that not mm-hmm. only is this place filled to the brim with all these um, shirt waists, the uh-huh. finished products, but that means that there's scraps and lint oh, yeah. lying around in huge piles the lint, everywhere. The thread scraps, yeah. And so there's no AC back in these days, so there's, uh, it's going to be hot in there. And uh, again, with the doors and everything being locked so that the women couldn't be taking any authorized <laughs> breaks anything bad happens in there one little tiny spark and that place is gonna go up super fast and the people inside aren't gonna get out and that's exactly what happened and to the best of my knowledge we do not know what started the fire but we didn't start the fire oh don't do this (laughs) singing about all these poor women i'm sorry all right it was 1911 1911 okay Says we do not know, I believe, what started that fire, but it is undoubtable because we have pictures and the witness accounts and the newspapers about it. That yeah, a fire was started. I believe it consumed at least the upper floors of this building. I don't remember how many floors in total it got. And we know that the doors were locked because among the things that survived were the locking mechanisms, yeah. which even though they were kind of burnt and destroyed yeah. in the fire, it was clear Intact. that the dead bolts were locked. <sighs> Okay, so from what I'm reading, there's they suspect that someone dropped an unextinguished match or cigarette butt in their scrap bin underneath their desk. Mm. Okay. So, like, they were smoking in there, too. This was inevitable, it seems like. Mm. Wow. So, yes, the, the place goes up. Again, the women couldn't get out, so a lot of women died in the fire. There were also, and we have pictures of this. I do show these pictures to my students so and give them a little bit of a warning about yeah. it. Where we know that several women choosing mm-hmm. to avoid burning to death broke the windows and just jumped out to their deaths. Yeah. Uh, some of the pictures that we have are rows and rows of mangled bodies as police officers oh are gosh. trying to, move, or maybe firemen too, were trying to move these bodies mm-hmm. off of the street or gather them together so that they're not creating more of a problems. Yeah. And then among the other pictures that I like to show are, I get, this is a, a condition of what life was like at the, I shouldn't say what life was like at the time, because I'm willing to bet it's probably very much still like this, mm-hmm. in that, all right, these were all factory workers, they're not by the standards of yeah. uh, of the world's attention, they're not important people. Right, they're, they're dime the a dozen class. workers, mm-hmm. who, who cares about them, who, who cares if they were even all American or whatnot. Right. So they had, after the whole incident was over, all these bodies that they could recover, they had to lay them out all, literally on the street. Just People are walking by because they're hoping somebody can identify <gasps> these women. Oh my god! They got no idea who they were. Nobody had IDs back then. Yeah. And these were poor lower class women. They don't know whose family do they need to notify. Well, and, and for practicality purposes, like... You don't have room in the morgue or, you know, wherever they would normally take a recovered body Mm -hmm. for people to come and identify. So, but they're literally lining them up outside in public. Mm -hmm. That's such a horrifying idea. So I I think this still happens in in the United States today, but I could be wrong. But at least back in this time, Uh what would often happen is anybody that couldn't be identified and perhaps even some that could be identified, but the family couldn't do anything yeah. as far as funeral arrangements or anything for mm-hmm. them. They all got thrown into uh, dime a dozen cardboard box yeah. coffins and buried in mass on a, d- some of the deserted islands that are out and about in the in the country. Wow. I think New York has a couple of those. There's just like island, I, I don't know where they are, but there are islands in the middle of some of the rivers or maybe really? even off the sea just a little bit where it's literally just a grave island. That's where, that's where they dump the mass, or the they put the mass graves. Dude, is that true? Yeah. Whoa. It, it usually, to the best of my knowledge, it usually only happens to, to unidentified yeah. people. But back in those days, unidentified would have included the poor people. Yeah. Wow. So why did we bring this up in regards to women's suffrage? Uh, My guess would be we brought it up because it was one of the incidents that really did a boon for Mm -hmm. promotion of the idea of women's rights and how, oh, because the idea that even the most callous guy would kind of look at this and say, 
that's wrong. Yeah. That, 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 that shouldn't have happened. Um, okay, I take that back. Not the most callous guy. The most callous guy would have said... Would <laughs> the have most said, callous guy locked the door. The, the most callous guy would have said, ugh, I'm going to be out of production for several days because of this. All right. Yeah. So it, it created... And, uh, it, it Like many things, it creates more attention to the mm-hmm. thing. It brings more of the dangers to people's minds. Yeah. And it has an effect on people that helps change... So again, this was a big thing, not just for women, but I think also for union and for safe working conditions. Right. The idea that these women didn't even have a chance because they were locked in. Right. So today, we look at all that and we're like, oh, that is atrocious. How could that have ever yeah. happened? It seems so obvious that that was a bad idea. But back in the day, like, like we kind of mentioned earlier, they were just poor workers, dime a dozen. Yeah. They didn't matter. What mattered was whoever the owners were that were trying to make their profits. Right. It's so crazy short-sighted, though. Like, I mean, it seems obvious now that a boss would go, you know what? If one little spark happens and everyone's smoking and there's all this cotton scraps around, this could end poorly and that would be bad for my bottom line. So maybe I should do something different. Like, it's so crazy that they didn't do that kind of a risk assessment. Which honestly is actually one of the reasons why I doubt the idea that a cigarette started, or at least a cigarette from one of the workers. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe a manager got oh. away with smoking in the area. But I'm willing to bet that no owner, or maybe even no manager, yeah. would have allowed the employees to be smoking during these shifts. Even though smoking yeah. was all the rage back in the time Everyone did period. it. Yeah. All pregnant women in the hospital were smoking. I, I wouldn't be surprised if a, if a manager or the owner said no, 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 none of the workers at least to smoking. Oh, but I wouldn't be surprised if a manager could have, couldn't have gotten away with uh, taking a smoke break once in a while, if not actively walking up yeah. and down with a cigarette. That makes more sense. It's still absurd, but yeah. I'm I'm gonna look that up. I'm curious about that. Cool. Because so yeah, we we tend to we tend to think that they didn't realize. Or sometimes people talk about this as though they didn't realize these things were unsafe. Oh yeah, people in and the past were like, all stupid no, across they, the board. <laughs> no, and on many occasions there were people that knew these things were unsafe. Yeah. They just didn't care. It was yeah. cheaper to replace the the worker that lost an arm or a leg oh, in the machine than it was to replace the machine itself. That's so Victorian thinking. Like but, when you well, have okay, children you, climbing in the machines you and You say Victorian, fingers. and I'm guilty of this myself, too, because I think I just said it, but there is a fair argument that this attitude is still one that some people have today. There yeah. are still people who own businesses, who run companies, mm-hmm. who run factories, that still could care less if one of their employees lost an arm or a leg so long as the work keeps getting done, right. which puts money in their pockets. Right, and I, and I know that's true. I know there's definitely places in the world where we purchase things from that are so, still so like So I should this. have meant something that I said. I didn't mean to say that we look at it today and see that, <laughs> oh, that was wrong. I said the, it's more common now yeah. today to look at that and see it as wrong right. than back in the day where you look at that and you saw oh no you just, you, you sympathize with the guy who just lost his factory that poor man's probably going to be poor now <laughs> right and we're kind of looking at it from a place of privilege with you know being able to see into the past it's, mm-hmm. it's in our distant past and we have never had to make the choice of working in conditions like that mm-hmm. in order to feed our family like what do you put up with in mm-hmm. order to get by in the short term okay well yeah we've never okay yeah i was about to argue with against that but i thought no okay yes we've never had to take a job that we knew was unsafe i was yeah. gonna say i've had to take plenty of jobs that i didn't like but yeah that's not the same thing well you could <laughs> argue that you've had a job that was unsafe but you're you're okay i do what what, what job do i have that's unsafe not my current job teaching. i'm very safe i'm very teaching safe is a scary job. profession <laughs> I'll give you that, I don't yes. think many teachers would argue with that. <laughs> it depends on the site that you get, and it depends on the students. <laughs> That's true. Because I, I, I've mentioned this before, and plenty of students that I've worked with, mm-hmm. everybody under the sun at the facility, yeah. has told me that, ugh, that person's going to be bad. Yeah. They're going to give you all kinds of guff or whatnot. And I was like, no, nah, he's been nothing but cool with me. Like, Aww, oh, that, that one guy I told magical. you about, he was cool with me. The mm-hmm. entire time, I loved working with him. Then all of a sudden, wait, he got into a fight? Yeah. They had to full on mace the guy? <laughs> what? I, 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 what? I, the guy was yeah. nothing but nice to me. The, the harshest thing I ever got from the guy once was he looked at me and said, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so rude. Yes. <laughs> 
well, not everyone can be perfect and wonderful and reach the students deeply like you. Yes, I am perfect and wonderful. <laughs> I, I have no history that I need to go back in time and fix or erase because I was perfect. From I the did beginning. everything perfect from the beginning. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can't think of a single mistake <laughs> I ever made in my lifetime. Right. Well, okay. I can think of one maybe uh, 20 odd years ago or so. Yeah, yeah. Keep talking. I love you. <laughs> All right. Anything else we should know about the Triangle Shirt Waist Factory? Um, again, to I know the, there's so many details about it, but again, to the insp uh, to the inspiration of the effect that it had, I mm -hmm. remember that on a couple of occasions, so the pictures that I've seen, um, women's rights mm -hmm. campaigns and unions uh, groups used the Triangle Shirt Waist Fire uh, on their posters, on their banners, yeah, it was and whatnot. A they would say point. like, "Yeah, we we stand with our sisters in the Triangle mm -hmm. Shirt Waist Fire," things of that mm -hmm. nature. So yeah, the the fact that it had this profound impact is undeniable, yeah. and I think this is one of those few things where uh, there's, so there's a lot of stuff that happens around about this time, mm -hmm. and this isn't, I think, one of the great where people that are getting a general education idea of history mm -hmm. don't tend to think too much about this time, but I think the Triangle Shirt Race Fire is still one of those things that it still captures people's interest yeah. when they hear about it, when they hear that wait, this thing actually happened? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, that's one of the reasons why I like bringing it up in history lessons. Right. It's, it's one of those, uh, it's one of those, hey, okay, you're going to hate me for using this word, but this is this is what? me. It's one of those cool things in history cool. it was so that cool. draws people's attention, that captivates them, yeah. that makes them want to learn more, want to know more. Right. It's so cool that almost 150 people died horribly, and 78 more were injured. <sighs> So cool. Okay, honey, tell me. Tell me something cool about history that you can think of. What's something cool? I'm not playing this game. Play it, honey. <laughs> Throw down your ace. Something cool that people used elephants in wartime. Oh, so war. You think war is cool? <laughs> you think people getting stampeded over on by a yep. whole bunch of elephants is cool? Yeah. Oh, you Visigoth. You yep. barbarian. You... Yep. What's that word from there? Your ghost show was be was bag wazik 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 wazik. Did I, I just know. curse? Are we gonna get banned in Britain now? <laughs> no, I don't think okay. so. <laughs> okay, so okay, so I get that this was a big deal. Okay, I do have a I have, I have a question. Okay, so I took a women's history class once. So of course, the Triangle Shirt Waist Fire was big part of it. Mm -hmm. We learned a lot. I don't remember any details, but I know we learned about it, and it was a big deal. I get that. Yes. But like I'm, I don't understand the leap from female workers dying in bad conditions to women should have the ability to vote. You've never heard of the sympathy vote? Explain. All right, so the sympathy vote. Let's see, what's a what's a not terrible <laughs> example? Something right. really controversial, honey. Let's go. Right. So, um, <laughs> no, okay. don't. Let, don't. I don't let, want let's to. Let's say that you have two equal candidates competing for a job. Yes. All right? So everything about them is the same. Their education level, mm -hmm. their experience level, their skin color, their gender identity, everything is level. So yeah. the interviewer has, is struggling to find some reason to yeah. pick one over the other. And then you find out that, oh, this one recently lost their spouse and is now raising the children alone. Yeah. Sympathy will kind of make them lead to, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to go with this one maybe. Sympathy. So, so I'm not saying that that's going to be 100% true in all situations. Yeah, but, but it's it the happens. idea that because I now have sympathy for something, because, because yeah. I have now been given reason to sympathize with somebody, now I'm more likely to go along with that even if I didn't okay. uh, accept their ideas before. I don't remember what we were uh, talking about, but an uh, old friend of mine and I were having a disagreement about something... I, I don't remember what it was. Um, he was making his points and I was making mine. And in my mind, mm -hmm. I, I, I knew I was right. I, and I was rather disappointed in my friend because he was making some very foolish conclusions. You're very but arrogant sometimes. I think it's justified. <laughs> you were right I'm, in this I'm, case. I'm, I'm, I get if it. If I've got evidence, <laughs> then yeah, I'm going to believe that I'm right. And if you don't prove to me with your evidence or you don't give me enough of your yeah. own evidence to suggest that I'm wrong, then yeah, I'm going to continue to think I'm right. How am I any different from the rest of us? <laughs> when we think like that. I think I what know, you're confusing is that I know more stuff a lot of the times yeah. in these discussions <laughs> than other people do. So 
I often enough, even if I don't convince them, yeah. I often enough will walk away from, no, I, I, I'm You're glad about this because I learned a little bit about them. I, I proved to myself, I yeah. think I proved through the course of the conversation that I was correct in my conclusion. So, uh, yeah. cool. But anyway. Sorry. I, yes, you had to do I'm being mean. I'm sorry. Right. And then, uh, like, I, I came up with what I thought was, like, the zinger. I'm like, oh, this is the perfect example. Yeah. So I threw that at him, and this should have shut him down. Uh-huh. But despite the fact that everything else that I said was flawless, yeah. he pointed out an error in my zinger. So my zinger was very, was very flawed. And at that point, I had to just concede that, oh, you know what? All right. You're right. It's possible. He didn't convince me, but yeah. I, because of sympathy, I wasn't inclined to continue to carry on this conversation <laughs> with him. I rephrase. I wasn't in try, I wasn't inclined to try to convince, convince him. him anymore and just accept that, all right, your points have been made. I'm good. Right. So while I, I do not believe that the Triangle Shirt Race Fire in and of itself directly said, oh, right. people are thinking, oh, because of all those women burned to death. We gotta let these people vote. Yeah, that's, that's what's gotta be done. Yeah, A to no, B think, doesn't make sense. I think it generated sympathy. Okay. So, like, plenty of people who were on the on the edge or on the cusp of uh-huh. maybe or in the middle ground, not sure which way they're gonna go. Yeah. They see something like this, and now it's like, okay, well, okay, yeah, maybe, yeah, I, I we should yeah. do that. Was it's there the, the, con- the, the the guilty conscience kind of thing? I guess you could say, uh-huh. which is all the rage today. There are plenty of political campaigns that still go on today yeah. that try to guilt people oh, for sure. try to play on that sympathy card to get stuff done yeah even if it's not in their best interest <laughs> but i'm not saying that women voting was not in the best interest i know there are plenty of people out there i hear them all no. the time who say that giving women the right to vote was not in the best interest of the no. country i do not agree with that <laughs> Was I can't there... speak for all women everywhere, but I know at least the one that I'm married to is smarter than me. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> In some things. <laughs> yeah, not political things. Well, no. We're talking about <laughs> voting! <laughs> what? I love you. And I love my daughters, and I'm sure that they're going to be good voters. Uh, I'm sure one of them is going to be a good voter. <laughs> not sure about the other one. That's fabulous. Okay, but was there also any idea of, like... If women were voting, women would have voted for better working conditions. Was that part of the discussion too? So no, I don't think so. That would make sense to me. And I'm, uh, I'm not inclined to say so, just because in this time period when unions and the idea of workers' rights and uh-huh. things are coming into being, at first the government is not involved in the way that you and I would think they were. So like okay. we tend to think that okay, the government has agencies to make sure that working conditions Regulations. are safe now. Yeah. yeah. So back in this day, that was not how the government was playing the part. Back in this time period, it was workers striking or demanding that that the employers provide better safety conditions, Uh better pay or whatnot. And the government got involved when the, more often than not, when the companies, the business owners would contact their buddies in government and say, hey, bust this strike for me. And the police would go out to get rid of the strikers. So instead of making sure that they got their more wages or they got their safe working conditions, they would get broken up so that right. either they would go away and then come back crawling to their bosses mm-hmm. or the boss could bring in some scabs. That, okay, yes. I should have known that. That makes sense. You know how I know that? How do you know that? Newsies. Huh. Because they, they bring in police to break up the, to break up the, the news yeah. voice strike. Yeah. Okay. And unless I'm mistaken, that still goes on to a smaller degree in that uh, if uh, there's a strike going on, there mm-hmm. are, there are I don't know them all, yeah. but there are rules about who can strike, when they can strike, where and how they can strike. Yeah. Well, you, and there are you still, can't block traffic. So there are still, go- well, okay, even with the rules, whatever they are, yeah. there are still plenty of companies out there who will try to get the government or the police or something mm. to do something which is not quite according to the rules of fair play okay. to help them win this side of the argument. Mm, I see. It's, it's, uh, it's, you've heard that expression that all is fair in love and war, right? Oh, for sure. People's definition of what is love and what is war <laughs> is very different. And there are plenty of people that think that business is one or the war. other. <laughs> right. Very cool. Yes. History is cool. Even when people die in I a fire. I shouldn't have said that. See, it's just a filler word that I, I use. I don't actually you. mean that it's cool. No, no. See, it's what I heard was that word. you accepted my way of thinking. 
Next thing I'm going to have you say is that history isn't horrible. There are things in history that are cool. There are things in history that are horrible. Yeah, tomato, potato. And the same thing can be cool and horrible at the same time, too. It's possible. Yeah, potato, tomato. <sighs> yes. All right. Do you have anything else to say? Oh, I have lots to say. Get us in trouble some more. So what I took out of this episode is that you think that women shouldn't have gotten the right to vote. Okay. And they only got it so, because of sympathy. When you wham, say... Wham, wham, 150 people died. So, honey, <laughs> I, I, I love you. I've conveyed that to you, yes? Yes. So when you say things like that, you have proven yeah. that everything flattering that I have tried to yeah. say about you is a lie. <gasps> that you really are a dummy. Because <laughs> I very clearly said that, n no, that women should have the right to vote. I also very clearly said that this did help get mm -hmm. that support and it wasn't exclusively because this thing happened right. that women got the right to vote. But then when you repeat mm -hmm. or when you say those things mm -hmm. back at me, what that tells our loyal listeners yeah. is that you are not actually listening to anything that I'm saying. I thought that was clear. And that clear. you are entrapping narratives, <laughs> wrong narratives in your brain and you are going to continue to go out and spout those. Perhaps even I teaching those to our children. Which is terrifying to me you know i love you do i though <laughs> i do try to listen you, you, to you, you most you of the tend time to, you tend to not think what you say here or say what you think here it's all for entertainment mm -hmm. sometimes i wonder which of us is the more entertaining one i mean i'm the most entertained that's for sure you're telling me people aren't entertained by my stories <sighs> some readers are gonna have to write in and tell us Readers, huh? Listeners. I don't know. Ah! I win again. <laughs> oh, no. I said one word wrong. <laughs> hey, that's all it takes in the world someday. <laughs> Say one word wrong and you it's can true. get blackballed for life. It's true. All right, we're done. It's really hot in here. <laughs> we're going to well, end so we can. Oh, you're so, you're so nice. I am, aren't I? But then, of course, What'd we can't say? be believing that because we've just proven that, <laughs> again, you're a fool. So I you're saying... I apologize if I called you something worse I'm than a fool, fool earlier. I don't remember I don't what words so. I used. Well, I, did, did I call you an idiot? Did it's I, possible. Okay. So, so you're saying that you should... I try to stick with the, the, the nicer insults, like <laughs> fool. Fool isn't as bad as idiot. So what you're saying is you don't think I should vote because you think I'm a fool. I do and not that think you're foolish smarter people should vote. Me. Or, uh, I should rephrase that. <laughs> well, uh, yes, I, I do not think foolish people should vote, but I recognize I'm not going to win that battle, and mm -hmm. I'm going to recognize that you can't. Well, you can fight ignorance, you can fight foolishness, but it's probably not something that's ever going to go away. You dodged the question. <laughs> I accused you of saying you shouldn't think you don't think I should vote because I'm a fool and that you know more about me than. In I politics. am among those people that would not object <laughs> terribly. <laughs> If we decided to make it a rule that you had to pass an IQ test or something to that nature in order to vote. That's dangerous territory. It is, it is, which is why I am not advocating for such a thing. I'm merely saying that I am not immediately opposed to it. So you're saying see, that I would, I would pass have to the see IQ what, test. I would have to see what their conditions were, what the measures were, what the oversight on the matter would be, mm -hmm. what the, the security of mm -hmm. the integrity of the process would mm -hmm. be in order for that thing. So, I trust we, no one. It would never work out. I, I don't know if we talked about this before. In ancient China, they had a test. You had to pass a test in order to qualify for any kind of government position or Wait, office. What? Yeah, this, this was throughout Chinese history. Well, not all Chinese history, but yeah. for an extended period of time in Chinese history, yeah, you had to take a test and pass this test if you were going to get any kind of government job or responsibility yeah. to prove that you were at least semi-competent. Yeah. I do not... It, it has merit. I'm not saying it was a perfect solution because plenty yeah. of bad stuff still went down oh, in China yeah. throughout its history, but the idea has merit, and like many other things that have merit... I would love to entertain to be part of the conversation, hmm. but I'm not going to make my final decision before that conversation has even happened. <laughs> right. That's very wise because you are so wise. I am wise, aren't I? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you for I listening. I make Gandalf look like a kindergartner. <laughs> thank you for listening. I would have had the good intention to just say, hey, eagles, just take us a little bit farther, huh? We'll, we'll get, get, get us the halfway there and then we'll ride the rest of the way. You're going to make the, the Lord of the Rings nerds mad at us now because I've seen people explain why that couldn't be. Oh, yeah. I know I've heard those fan theories too. <laughs> I'm sure they have some merit. <laughs> yes. 
If you liked what you heard, then please subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a five-star review. I'm glad that they didn't ride the Eagles, though, because then there would be no story. Exactly. I like this story. If you'd like to hear a future episode with more information about today's topic, that being the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire <laughs> and not Shirley's Foolishness, contact us on Gmail, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok at Married to History Pod. If they want to see my foolishness, they can see my TikTok. <laughs> I'm sure there's been examples of your foolishness since the day they found out you married me. Ah, uh, true. Now, which one of us Self-burn. was the greater fool there? <laughs> also, please contact us if you have a silly question idea or if there's something from history that you would love to learn about. Just be sure to specify in your message if it's about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory or about <laughs> Shirley's foolishness because we don't want to treat um, people dying in a tragic incident just like we would the silliness of my beloved wife. Right. Talk to you next time. (laughs) Bye. Bye. All right. uh, Which one am I reading? The yellow one. There's two yellow ones. Which one is the top one? I didn't say that already. You haven't said nothing. Have I not been speaking this whole time? There you go. I don't know. I'm not listening. Give me strength.